On your Monday episode of Locked On Raptors, if the Toronto Raptors are going to take a guard with the 19th overall pick, that guard had better check a couple of boxes. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, June the 3rd. And I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server. Baby, the link is in the description of the podcast. It's free to join, and it's a great place to come hang out among pals who love the Raptors, who want to talk about the draft and trades and things like that, and definitely not get admonished by me for really, really bad Zach Levine trade ideas. Come hang out. A great place to be among friends. The link in the description is always free to join. Would love to see you become part of our listener community over on the Discord. Of course, you can find the show for free. Wherever you get your podcast, follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. On the audio side of things, you can also go to YouTube and subscribe to the Lockdown Raptors YouTube channel. When you do that, hit the notification bell, and it will give you a heads up via push notification every single time the show is about to premiere or go live. We've got lots of great stuff in store as we are now just over three weeks away from the NBA draft. No one cares about the stupid finals between the two detestable franchises. No, it's draft time, baby. And so we're talking all about that in the next few weeks, obviously, beyond that, trades and free agency. We'll talk about all of that at various points this week. We'll get into some more, uh, you know, fun stuff, pulling names from bowls, wing targets for the Raptors. William Liu is going to come on the podcast this week. Our dear pal Will with his new podcast. Hello and welcome to promote all that good stuff. Uh, and again, you, you will never miss any of it if you go and subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notification bell. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, who help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And we get rolling here on your Monday, and we're talking draft stuff. We, we, we kind of have oscillated back and forth between draft and free agency slash trade targets. And today, the wheel stops on draft guys, and it stops on guards. Uh, we have not talked a ton of guards. We talked a little bit when it seemed like the Raptors still might pick in the top six about your Rob Dillinghams, your Reed Shepherds, your Nikola Topiches, et cetera, et cetera. Haven't dug too deep into the guard class a little bit later on in the first round. And that's because mostly I think it's pretty clear that the Raptors' biggest needs are in the front court and on the wings. They need size. They need uh, some variability and skill sets at the big man position. They need wings to elongate their lineups, fill their lineups out put guys in the right positions to succeed around those defensive wing types. And so I think because of the bounty of those types of players available in that range between 19 and 31, I do think the Raptors got to lean and look really hard at at sort of taking those types of players with those picks. But there are guards in this range of the draft too. And there are arguments to be made that guard is a, is a reasonable target for the Raptors in this year's draft as well, especially if the talent and the upside there is there for them to really swing on, you know, that there is a case that at least one of the guards we're going to talk about today is one of the higher upside players in the back part of this first round. And, you know, why not take a swing on a guy who might be able to one day become something close to a star? Uh, Obviously, that's a big ifs, lots of uh, caveats and things that need to be hurdled before we get to that. We will talk about Bub Carrington coming up later on. That's the guy. Uh, We're also going to get into Tyler Kolek, who maybe features more as like a high floor backup. And off the top, we're going to talk about Jared McCain from Duke. But before that, I just want to get into the sort of philosophy of drafting a guard at number 19 if you're the Raptors. I do think there are a couple of boxes that simply have to be checked by a guard prospect if the Raptors are going to use their best pick in this draft, number 19, on a guard uh, at a position that is just of less dire need. That's not to say they don't need some guard help because they do, right? Masai Ujiri talked after the season about wanting to address the backup point guard spot, and that's certainly a thing they could go and try to do in this draft. But again, I think if they're going to do that, it's got to be a particular kind of guard. Number one, it's got to be an upside play. I I think at 19, if you're taking a guard, you have to be taking someone who you think can eventually become a high-level starter, some sort of fringy all-star type, 
any kind of all-star projection is, I think, very lofty for this part of this draft. But, you know, you got to hope and, and sort of believe in your scouting and say, hey, like if we're taking this guy, there's a chance this guy becomes high-end talent for us that changes our lives tangibly when it comes to how we stack up in the Eastern Conference going forward. I also think you got to pick someone who could potentially grow into playing in two guard lineups with one Emmanuel quickly, who we know is going to get the bag from the Raptors this summer, barring some kind of disaster for which everyone should be fired. If it befalls the Raptors, it's not going to happen. They're going to keep him. They're going to sign him. I'm not worried about that, but you do have to, if you're taking a guard at number 19 factor in that, you know, the path to being the lead guard on this team is tough to clear because Emmanuel quickly is going to be there for the next four or five seasons, depending on what kind of deal he gets. And so to maximize that 19th pick, you have to take someone who in theory can play with Emmanuel quickly. And, you know, that might take certain guys of certain size out of the conversation. It might take certain guys of different skill sets out of the conversation as long-term fits. And so if you're taking a guard, I do think it has to be someone who is not going to be topped out on this roster as a high-end backup to Emmanuel quickly, who you can't throw out in two guard lineups. I think someone that you're taking at 19, you have to envision, hey, one day this guy can either be a starting two guard for us or someone who can play in second units and sort of sprinkle in with a quickly and have those two guard lineups be viable against opposing offenses. And so um, that that's a big thing for me. I, and I, again, I think the upside play is a really, really important one about this. Like that, that ties into the whole, does he fit with click quickly and can he be a starter one day as well? Um, but I, I think those two things, the, the, the fit next to quickly in theoretical two guard lineups and upside are the kind of two boxes that need to be checked here. So let's get into some of these guys. Let's talk Jared McCain off the top. Jared McCain's a guy, you know, he's kind of rising right now. He, he's been on the upward trajectory since the sort of draft season began. And I, and I get it, right? If you know Jared McCain, six foot two, six foot three guard out of Duke, uh, was a pretty solid freshman, was a five star recruit coming in, didn't play a ton on the ball. He played more away from the ball. Those guys like Kyle Filipowski and Tyrese Proctor had more of the action in their hands. And in his off ball role, he absolutely excelled as a catch-and-shoot three-point guy. Absolutely lights-out three-point shooter is Jared McCain. Shot north of 40%. The transition pull-up threes that he busts out a whole lot are really impressive. Beautiful footwork on them. Um, just like, uh, you know, for anyone who appreciated Kyle Lowry's ability to pull up for three in transition, Jared McCain kind of checks that box. He's got a, a lot of shooting talent, and I do think he's going to be a, an NBA player because of it, right? The problem that I kind of run into watching McCain is look, size is size. He's six foot three with kind of a negative wingspan. And while, you know, scouts who, you know, rate him highly have said, okay, well, he's like pretty good as like a point of attack defender against opposing guards. He's pretty strong, et cetera. Um, there still remains the fact that in the NBA, as the league skews bigger and bigger, guys who are six two, six three are just going to be sore spots for opposing offenses to pick at. And if those guys don't offer you a lot in the way of offensive production, it gets hard to keep those guys on the floor. You know, for example, Emmanuel quickly, I think perfectly fine guy to have on the floor as your sort of lead point of attack guy. Maybe he's not perfect, but there are a lot of imperfect lead point of attack guys who also are incredible lead guards. And I do think Emmanuel quickly with his mix of playmaking, pull up shooting, ability to get to the rim and pressure it, like all of that it bodes well for Emmanuel quickly and what he's going to do um, for the Raptors in this kind of role going forward. I, I, you know, I, I think with Jared McCain, I'm a little bit less sure that there's that sort of fully faceted game outside of the three-point shooting to really believe in. I, I think he's pretty dependent on threes, right? 55% of his attempts this past season came as three-point shots, does not get to the rim a ton. His handle just like, he doesn't have a ton of burst. It's a lot of, you know, couple of dribbles and, you know, tries to pull up from a mid ranger after pushing a guy off, things like that. He does not get to the rim very often. And I really don't see a world in which, like, you know, quickly McCain lineups work defensively. Offensively, sure, it can work because McCain is an off ball guy, is going to be a dead eye shooter, I think. Um, and you can run him with the ball in his hands a little bit. Again, that's that's kind of like a little bit of a mystery with his game just because he didn't get a ton of on ball reps in college at Duke. He was playing off the ball. And hey, maybe it's a situation like you get with some of the Kentucky guys over the years where there's just so much guard talent on all of those teams that 
there are certain guys who just never get the shot to have the ball in their hands all that often. And so that you're left kind of guessing as to what the role is going to look like in the NBA. Emmanuel quickly, very much one of those guys. Um, but with Jared McCain, I think when you do watch the reps he's had on the ball, it's like passable, but it's not dynamic. He's not like blowing by guys with speed. He's not uh, busting out all kinds of crafty dribble packages and slowing it down and speeding it up and, you know, sort of keeping defenses on their on their toes and, and really keeping them off balance. I, I don't quite think that is in his game with the ball in his hands. And I think he's probably more of like a tertiary ball handler type guy. Maybe he runs second units, things like that. But I don't think you're really asking him to go and break down defenses, uh, especially considering Emmanuel quickly is already on this team and does that, I think, at a higher level than Jared McCain projects to do. Um, you know, I, I just the shooting's really legit. But if you're only a shooter in the modern NBA, like how valuable are you really? Like, is there a world in which Jared McCain becomes like Malik Beasley, where it's like, okay, really nice regular season player. It's awesome to have him out there bombing away threes for you. But when things get really serious in the playoffs, is that the type of guy who can stay on the floor and carry big high leverage minutes for you? And if the answer to that question is no, like I, I just, it's a tough type of player archetype for me to go and take with the highest pick the Raptors have in this draft. If McCain were there at 31, totally different story. And frankly, like he's probably not even going to be there at 19 because there are teams ahead of the Raptors who maybe have big creators already on their teams looking just for some shooting and space and sort of supplementary scoring um, who might be more inclined to take a Jared McCain. They're not asking him to go and become a high leverage creator for them. You know, I could see that being the type of guy that, you know, a more contender ready team goes and strikes at. But for the Raptors at 19, if McCain is there, I just think there's going to be other options out there who better fill in the gaps that this roster has. And frankly, I think there are other guards who could be there who make a lot more sense for what the Raptors need than Jared McCain. I'm probably a little lower on McCain than consensus just based on what I've seen. Again, I, I think the three-point shooting is like a no-doubt NBA skill. The rest of it I'm a little bit uncertain about. And I, again, I do think there's a real chance he kind of just becomes this smallish three-point shooting specialist who has a place and can amplify good players in the regular season. But in the postseason, his playability becomes more of a question mark. And so for me, if he's the pick at 19, I think I probably would have wished that they did something else with that pick, whether it be a guard or a big um, or a wing, obviously. And, and, you know, one of those guards who I think I'd prefer at 19, we're going to talk about coming up next. Bub Carrington, baby. The guy's name is Bub. It rocks. We're going to talk about him in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business and you want to feel quality, you want to find quality professionals that are right for your role. And that's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals with a B, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates so easy in fact that 86 percent of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours of posting a job that's a big deal i used to be a hiring manager at a job of mine and it is a lot it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of brain power and you have other stuff to worry about if you're a small business owner that beyond that so let linkedin do the hiring for you two and a half million small businesses use linkedin for hiring you should too post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on nba that's linkedin.com slash locked on nba to post your job for free terms and conditions apply Back at it here on your Monday edition of Locked On Raptors. Talking guards, baby. And a, a guy we're going to get into here, Bub Carrington. I'm pretty into him, man. Cool player. We're going to talk about him in just one sec. Before we do that, just a reminder, Locked On Sports Today 24-7 is your all-day streaming channel over on YouTube with Locked On shows all the live long day. If you want to avoid doing work, if you want to have white noise on while you do work, if you want your work to be the white noise while you watch podcasts, it's all there for you. Locked on sports today, 24-7. Local stories covered by the local experts uh, and obviously the biggest stories in sports covered by the same local experts as well. A lovely thing. Go check it out. Locked on sports today, 24-7. All right. Bub Carrington, six foot five guard, was a freshman out of Pitt this past season, averaged 13 points a game, five boards, four assists on 51% on his twos. 32% on threes. We'll get to the threes in just a second with him and 79% 
at the line. And hey, playing in the ACC against tough competition. And I think of the guys we're going to talk about today, we'll get to Tyler Kolek. We've talked about Jared McCain. I do think Bub Carrington, those two boxes that I talked about off the top, theoretical long-term fit with quickly and being an upside play. I think Bub Carrington checks both of those boxes. Um, he's got a shot to be good at arguably the single most important thing you can be good at in modern basketball. The skill that launches the careers of guards year after year, it is pull-up shooting. Bub Carrington has got pull-up juice to him in a way that a lot of these other guys in this draft just do not. Um, six foot five, so he's got a big frame as well. And he he just he he figures to have. Um, that pull-up juice, that ability to bend defenses just with the own threat of him creating his own shot and rising and firing from anywhere, that totally shifts how defenses have to play. It alters pick-and-roll coverages. It alters uh, what types of players you can put onto a guy. It, it just completely changes the shape of the floor. Um, and we saw the effect of this for the Raptors this past season, for example, where you go from Fred Van Vliet, one of the best pull-up shooters in basketball, who always caused defenses to have to worry about him pulling up from the top of the pick and roll, you know, 30 feet away, no matter. That is a shot that he can take and make, and defenses had to respect it. Then you have the Dennis Schroeder era, short-lived as it was, where there's just no pull-up juice whatsoever. Teams can go under screens at their, their leisure, and it just becomes really hard to get anything going in your offense because you're just kind of driving into morasses of bodies. And I, I just don't think... That's a, a thing that you can kind of have in the modern NBA, like a lead guard who can't pull up from three. It's a death sentence for modern NBA offense. And we saw the stark change from Schroeder over to Emmanuel quickly. His pull-up game, incredible. He was emboldened by Darko Ryakovich to use it even more as time went on, and that completely changes, again, the shape of the floor, opens up all kinds of space, and I think for this team, you know, Quickly's addition was like the single most transformative thing they could have done this year. Uh, really excited to see a full season of him and Scotty Barnes working in concert with one another. But that pull-up shooting, that is the skill. That is the key to modern guards being successful in the NBA. I mentioned Kyle Lowry earlier talking about the pull-up threes in transition from Jared McCain. Kyle Lowry's entire career took off because he could pull up. And it sort of just changed the type of player he was, changed his archetype. He became, he went from being this sort of rugged, nasty bulldog point guard to, oh, he's just like one tier below Steph Curry and Damian Lillard when it comes to the best pull-up three-point shooters in the NBA. And the Raptors had like top five offenses for like six, seven straight years as a result of that. You know, obviously, lots of things happened, but that I think was the single biggest swing skill that unlocked that era of Toronto Raptors basketball it was Kyle Lowry becoming a pull-up three-point shooter. So, Bob Carrington, pull-up shooting, a thing he's pretty good at, specifically from the mid-range, really gets to the mid-range and knocks him down, you know, one, two dribbles, things like that, getting run off the line, you know, from a standstill, creating a pick and roll. He can get to those mid-rangers uh, with ease, and, and he knocks him down a ton. Um, from three, a little bit more of a question, right? 32% from three this season. Did not shoot very well on catch and shoots and shot, you know, just about as well on his pull ups. And I think that's encouraging, right? Like if you're shooting as well on catch and shoots as you are on pull ups, that probably means you've got some pull up juice to your game. Probably also means there's a little bit of sort of more potential to squeeze out of the catch and shoot game. Uh, and so because of the shot diet that Bub Carrington had, where it was a lot of pull ups, a lot of self creation, a lot of him trade trying to create something from nothing. I think a lower three-point percentage is not terribly concerning. He shot 79% at the line, and as that skill refines and he kind of hones it in over the years to come, that's the upside thing, right? If his pull-up threes go from low 30s to 36, 37, 38%, oh boy, you have yourself a player. And I think Bub Carrington stands a pretty good shot at that. Like He gets to his shot comfortably. Again, he's six foot five, so he's going to be unbothered by most smaller guards who are up against him. Um, and I think he's got a pretty good craft for how to like use screens to create space for himself. Obviously, a super valuable skill for any pull-up shooting guard. Again, that was the thing Kyle Lowry was just so bloody good at. Take a screen from Jonas Valanciunas, and all of a sudden you have that little pocket of space to pull up. I think Bub Carrington has a similar knack for uh, getting to those pull-ups quickly when the screen gives him the space to, to get to it. Um, you know, I also think... There's more than just the the pull up threes and the pull up mid ranger stuff with him too, right? I think he was a little three point dependent at college. Fifty two point three percent of his shots came from deep, so over half, um, and a lot more also came from the mid range. Just did not get to the rim 
a ton. Just a lot of those one to two dribble pull-ups. And, and also when you look at his playmaking, he wasn't exactly like getting into the teeth of the defense all the time and creating for his four assists a game either. A lot of his assists come without a foot in the paint. And he's really good at a few of these things, right? He's got a real knack for throwing passes to guys on the interior in a place where only his teammate can catch it, you know, getting it to the right side of the big when the big's calling for it, things like that, um, sort of navigating tough pockets of space to make those passes ungrabbable for the defense. That's a thing he does really well. Uh, another thing you'll see in Bub Carrington's, you know, pick and roll creation is he'll take the screen, kind of veer usually to the right. He's pretty right-hand dominant from what you've seen, um, but he'll veer to the right. And he's really great at making that cross court pass to a lifting up corner shooter up to the wing. Um, you know, sometimes it's a shorter pass than others. Sometimes he whips it like full across the court in a beautiful skip pass. Um, but he's really good at making that pass to the lifting wing coming up from the corner. And I'm imagining just like, all right, death by a million Grady Dick catch and shoot threes coming around a Bub Carrington, Jakob Pertle pick and roll. Like that could totally be a thing. That's part of the Raptors if Bub Carrington were to be on the Toronto Raptors. Like that's uh, a really interesting skill that he has. I think he's nice with entry passes and finding guys on the roll again, even when he's not getting into the paint himself. And I do wonder just like the space of the NBA game as the pull up gets refined and becomes more of a thing that teams got to worry about being just something that can kill them with the math. You know, if he's shooting 35, 36% from three on pull ups, you have to go over the screen. You have to alter your coverage that opens up things on the back side. And I do think that with his handle, his craft, he's maybe not a guy who gets downhill, which is like insane explosiveness. But from what I've seen, and look, again, I've seen Bub Carrington a whole lot less than the experts who cover this stuff. So all of that with a grain of salt and everything. But, um, you know, when you watch Bub Carrington, I think there's a lot of craft, a lot of sort of, you know, side to side, a lot of keeping guys on his hip, using his size to his advantage. I think there's a craft to his pick and roll game that, could see him become more of a rim threat in the NBA if teams got to worry about that pull-up. Um, there's more space, and that pull-up is just something that teams are going to be scared of if, if it can get to the place that it feels like it can get to with some development in the coming years. And so, again, that's the upside thing, right? There's just ways that he can use the skills he already has to kind of broaden the, the things he can do in the NBA as those things get better. Um, and I think that's a, a really encouraging thing. I also think with the playmaking, too, 41 assists, sorry, 4.1 assists. Whoops, 4.1 assists a game to 1.9 turnovers. Um, you know, two to one assist to turnover ratio. You'll never, you know, be upset about that for a guard coming in. Um, I also think he does like a pretty good job throwing tough passes when he does get into the teeth of the defense. Again, not all that often, but he does this sort of like he almost half gnashes the pick and roll, gnashing the pick and roll. You might remember Steve Nash kind of running pick and roll, going through the paint, keeping his head up, and then just kind of going back out the other side and maybe making a pass to a cutter or resetting the possession. Um, oftentimes, it was just like a dunk for Amari Stoudemire. Um, but I think Carrington does a pretty good job of sort of half gnashing it where he'll get to like just under the basket, spot where he can maybe put up a reverse, but instead he'll spray it out to a shooter up top or on the wing or whatever it might be. Like He's got, a, I think, a pretty good knack for um, almost gnashing the pick and roll. It's not like full gnashing, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and, and again, as he kind of levels up the pull-up shooting, I think all of those paint touches will be that much easier to get to. The fact that he was able to put up the season he did without being a guy who really gets to the paint a whole lot, I think pretty promising. And, and I think there's a lot of upside there. Poor Bub Carrington. Defensively, you know, not much of a defensive playmaker. He's big, I guess, but he's also not like the strongest guy in the world. He's not the fastest guy going side to side or anything like that. I think, you know, you're probably hoping he nets out as like a neutral defender, which is maybe a concern for that fitting next to Emmanuel quickly thing that we talked about, right? If he's not someone who can be out there and play in two guard lineups and be viable defensively, that becomes a bit of a sore spot, especially considering RJ Barrett himself is not an unbelievable defender by any means and is already someone that I'm looking to try to um, sort of push him up the positional spectrum in order to replace him on the wing with a better defender. But, um, you know, that's something that can be worked on, obviously, too. And I, th I do think Bub Carrington, just with his size at 6'5", like he's not someone who's going to get bullied around, you know, just because he's the smallest guy on the floor. So, um, you know, again, at 19, I'd be fine with him if he was the pick. I, I think he's probably, of these guards we're going to talk about, the guy I'd be most happy with at 19. And I would be maybe a little less enthused if McCain or Tyler Kolek, who we'll get to here with a 19th pick. But uh, Carrington, I think the upside is real enough, and the pull-up shooting is just such a valuable freaking skill 
that I'd be all right if he was the guy at 19. Um, and then you figure out the wing and big thing later. It makes those you know th- things harder to figure out, right? You're only using one of your picks in theory then on a big or a wing as opposed to using two picks on wings or one on a big, one on a wing to go and address those sort of sore spots right now. But that opens up, obviously, the opportunity to go and do that stuff via free agency and trade instead. So, um, yeah, I, I think it doesn't like box them in or anything like that. I would be totally fine with Bub Carrington. And again, his name is Bub. Like, that's just, I feel like that has to have some cachet uh, if we're talking about guys who are going to have NBA success. Maybe that's just me being stupid. Either way, we're going to come back on the other side, get to do a very different type of prospect, someone with a high floor, someone who maybe is never a starter, but maybe is worth one of these picks the Raptors have. We're going to talk Tyler Kolek coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships, is all uh, is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Back at it here on your Monday episode of Locked On Raptors, talking draft guys as we uh, run through some guards who might be there for the Raptors at 19 and or 31. Uh, I think the guys we talked about already, Bob Carrington, Jared McCain, probably gone by the time 31 comes around. Both might be gone by the time 19 comes around. Frankly, both are rising up boards quick, it seems. Uh, but this guy... Very well could be there for the Raptors at 19 or 31, although I think I'd prefer him as a 31 target. Tyler Kolek, the 23-year-old senior guard out of Marquette, last season averaged 15, 5, and 8 as the straw that stirred the drink for Marquette. Um, And it's just like a really, really good point guard, extremely good over his last two college seasons. Um, And you remember going into the March Madness tournament, the Marquette was like missing Kolek for injury and that kind of spelled doom for them. He comes back early in the tournament. They, I think they get a couple of wins out of it, but, but before he came back, everyone was just like, Oh, upset special. They're going down. They don't have Tyler Kolek to keep things together. Um, he's good. He's a good player. And again, 23 years old. So he's older, closer to whatever he's going to be, I suppose. But a couple of numbers just from his efficiency that really stand out. 55% on twos. He shot 60% at the rim with almost half of his attempts, attempts coming at the rim. And of course, shot 39% on threes. Um, and as a catch and shoot guy, one of the very best college basketball catch and shoot guys this past season, 97th percentile as a catch and shoot three point shooter per college basketball scouting. Um, you know, that's very interesting to be that good as a catch and shoot guy. Um, especially on a team that in theory, if you were drafting Tyler Kolek, maybe there's some second units where he's working with say Scotty Barnes, for example, and Barnes has the lion's share of the, the ball in his hands, having a point guard who can also bomb threes on catch and shoots, not a bad theoretical fit there. Um, yeah, I, I think, look, if signing like a, a, a Monte Morris or a DeLon Wright type steady handed backup point guard, isn't your flavor, then I totally think Tyler Kolek makes some sense. I prefer, I think, the avenue of just like signing a tried and true vet uh, backup point guard because I think, you know, that that's one of the easier positions to fill in the NBA overall. And I think, you know, even with a guy like Tyler Kolek being further down his development curve, like I, I don't want to wait for a guy to be good at back, backup point guarding. Just like get a good one in and, you know, hopefully – um, they can just kind of steady the ship in second units. Like you don't need much from a backup point guard. I think they can go and find that in for agency with a part of the mid level or whatever it might be. And so I think I skew towards using these picks, not on backup point guards, but Tyler Kolek is probably the best of the bunch. If you're looking at guys who are going to be long-term, very reliable backup point guards, um, you know, different sort of 
like shot profile than say a Fred Van Vliet. But I do think like early backup Fred Van Vliet, where he was just rock solid, was able to provide for second units and really kind of keep them and shepherd them along. I think that's something Tyler Kolek could do. Um, although Tyler Kolek way less three point dependent than Fred Van Vliet kind of is or or was. Just 34 and a half percent of his attempts come from three point range for a guy who shoots 39 percent and is only six foot three. You know, the guy gets to the rim a lot. He has a lot of craft, um, you know, kind of really good stop and start can kind of keep defenses guessing as to what his next move is going to be. Um, and again, he shot 60 percent at the rim. If you want to kind of go and look at one game that I think highlights the ability for Tyler Kolek to score among the trees. They played Purdue kind of in the earlier part of the season. I think of the Maui Invitational, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he scored 22, 7, and 6 on 6 of 9 two-point shooting against Zach Eady's Purdue early this season. Um, some highlights in there of just kind of completely evading Zach, Zach Eady's rim protection. Uh, that's a really nice thing to have, right? It's not to say he's going to go and be an incredible at-rim finisher in the NBA. Again, 60% is only fine. It's not like incredible. You obviously, like your best players in the NBA are around 70% or better, you know, mid-60s ideally, but 60% in college, in the cramped floor that is college basketball, um, scoring among the trees, and again, getting to the rim for 47% of his attempts. That's pretty encouraging for Tyler Kolek as well. Um, and again, just like the three-point shooting is nasty with him. Like he, he just knocks him down from everywhere. Um, the pull-up game, not as advanced as the catch-and-shoot stuff. but um, and, and I think uh, it's the ringer draft board kind of notes that his pull-up release is a little bit slow. Maybe not fully able to take advantage of the value of a great pull-up shot. Um, just as it currently stands against NBA athletes and the NBA speed. But that's something that can be refined for sure. And again, 39% from deep on pretty high volume from downtown. It's pretty nice stuff, man. Like I, I think uh, there's a real case that Tyler Kolek is one of the safer picks in this draft to just be a longtime NBA player. Now, at 19, do you want to go for someone who probably, you know, tops out as a point guard that, uh, sorry, as a backup point guard? Probably not. I, I think the concerns about him fitting next to Emmanuel quickly would be pretty real. Like, uh, you're probably not running out Kolek quickly lineups and hoping to survive on defense. But again, you know, to the point of, can you sprinkle him in with Scotty Barnes lineups? Absolutely. I think you could, I think that'd be a really nice potential fit. And it just gives a second unit, like an adult to run the show, which, um, you know, I feel like the Raptors have sorely missed in recent seasons when they've really kind of just gone with the one point guard model, whether it was Fred Van Vliet or Schroeder or now Emmanuel quickly, like just another guy with just sort of a point guards head for things, a finger on the pulse of the action able to set guys up, able to kind of feel the the flow of a game and just kind of settle things down, control things. The Raptors have not had that. And I think a Kolek, for example, in those second units with Scotty Barnes, um, you know, whoever you want to sprinkle in as the staggered in starters and, and then bench guys, Grady Dick, et cetera, et cetera. I think that you could do a lot worse than that. You know, not a huge defensive playmaker or anything like that. You know, had a steal percentage near 3%, which is kind of the the number you like uh, to guys to be over. Just a little smidge below that. Not blocking shots or anything like that. But again, just like an adult who knows how to run a team. Um, I think there's a real value for that. But at 19, like I think similar to Jared McCain, I think it's tough to use that pick on someone who probably doesn't have a path to being more than a very good backup with the Raptors with the current team construction. Um, again, I, I think if, if there weren't a bunch of wings and bigs projected to go in this range, I think it'd be a different story. Um, but I think there are a lot of those, those types of guys who the Raptors badly need. And so I would prefer to kind of take a swing on, I don't know, like a Khalil Ware or any one of the wings, Keyshawn George, et cetera, et cetera, that we've talked about um, over Tyler Kolek, even if Kolek maybe has a more sort of surefire path to being an NBA player. Um, just I think the upside plays there at 19 for the, the wings and bigs who, again, the Raptors badly need to add into the mix here are just too tantalizing. And again, there's other guys in those that range who are just going to probably be pretty high floor players as well, right? A Tristan Da Silva, for example, like probably not a star, but if he's like a decent, you know, rotation player for you, that probably has more value than Tyler Kolek being a decent rotation player for you because of the ability you have to go out and address backup point guard in free agency or with a small little trade or something like that. Um, it's just an easier spot to go and fill than six, nine wing types who again are available in abundance around this range of the draft, not to mention the other bigs. And so yeah, 19, I don't think I'd be super keen on it. Even if I think Kolek has a chance of, you know, in theory, netting out to being one of those guys in the sort of Dennis Schroeder, Tyus Jones tier of best backup point guards in the NBA. 
like I think Colette could get there. I, I just, you know, with this pick being as important as it is for the Raptors to just kind of add talent to the mix, I, I think as much as getting one of the best backups in the league is a an, un, like an objectively great thing to do with the 19th pick, I, I don't quite see it being the right pick, right fit for the Raptors at this time. That said, if Tyler Colex there at 31, you've taken your wing or big at 19, and Colex there at 31, you want to take him, by all means, I'm all in on that. I think that would be totally fine, a, a very sort of safe way to take a second round pick and just ensure you're going to get something out of it for the years to come. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at with Tyler Kolek. That's kind of where we're at with this guard class. I think Bub Carrington, the clear preferred guy between the three we talked about today at 19, just based on the fit, checking the boxes the Raptors need. But all these guys are interesting. All these guys are probably going to be NBA players for a little while here. I don't think you can go super duper wrong. And again, I don't think McCain will be there at 19 anyway. But um, if Bub Carrington's the surprise non-wing or big pick at 19, I think that'd be kind of fun. Um, anyway, we will leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll come back tomorrow and play another round of Wings from a Bowl, where I'll take guys who are wings and potential targets for the Raptors out of a bowl, and we'll talk about them. Very excited for that. Uh, you have that to look forward to on tomorrow's show. We got lots of good stuff on tap for this week, including William Liu coming up on Friday's podcast. Very much looking forward to talking to my dear pal, Will. It's been a while since he was on the show, but we're going to talk about his new podcast, talk about the Raptors offseason and all that good jazz. Uh, and we'll try to get some more fun guests, draft guests, things like that for the next few weeks as the draft draws near. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for rocking with the show. Please go subscribe, follow, rate, review, tell a friend on your audio app of choice. You can also go to YouTube and subscribe so you never miss an episode in video form. You can join the live chats and stuff over there. And of course, join the Discord. Link in the description. Free to join. Great place to come hang out, especially as the draft draws near. We'll probably do some live voice hangouts, things like that, uh, as we get closer to the draft as well. So thank you so much for being here and rocking with us. We'll talk to you again on Tuesday with another episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for hanging. Bye-bye.